All right, everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Marsha Tate webinar on using parent and teacher partnerships to prepare students for success in school and life, sponsored by Corwin Press. My name is Taryn Williams, and I will be moderating this webinar over the next hour or so. We have a jam-packed schedule full of exciting information and discussion opportunities, so I'm very pleased to have you all with us. Before we jump into the webinar, I just wanted to go over a few reminders. The first is that to hear sound for this webinar, you'll have to enable your computer speakers. So if you see this message and cannot hear me, please make sure that you turn your speakers on. Also, um, we have disabled your computer microphone and video features for this webinar, so you won't be able to contribute audibly or visually, but you will be able to ask questions to Marsha by using the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. So if you have something to contribute during the webinar or if you'd like to ask Marsha a question, please don't hesitate to participate. And lastly, we have established a Twitter hashtag for this webinar. So for all of you out there who are social media experts, please feel free to talk about the webinar by using hashtag Tate Success. And with that, let's get started. During this webinar, we'll have a 35-minute presentation by Dr. Tate on the four aspects of development for holistically healthy children, as well as specific strategies within each of those four areas that parents and teachers can begin to implement immediately. After Marcia presents, we'll be joined by Principal Zach Cazares and three parents from Lenore Kirk Elementary School in the Dallas Independent School District to have a roundtable discussion about some of the techniques that Dr. Tate mentioned during the webinar. We will conclude the webinar by asking Dr. Tate to answer some of the questions posted by you in the chat. So again, if you would like a direct response from Dr. Tate at the end of the webinar, please participate during the webinar in the chat box on the left-hand corner of your screen. Now I am pleased to introduce the best-selling Corwin author, Dr. Marcia Tate. Dr. Tate not only had a 30-year career working as both a teacher and administrator at the DeKalb County School Systems, but she also spent the last decade as an educational consultant, teaching more than 350,000 administrators, teachers, parents, and business and community leaders throughout the world about her dendrite growing strategies. Marsha's latest book, Preparing Children for Success in School and Life, is focused on raising success respectful, responsible children who achieve to their fullest potential, guiding children towards personal, academic, and career success by focusing on the four aspects of healthy development, and using effective dendrite growing strategies both at home and at school. As Marcia presents during the webinar, she will be discussing excerpts from both the book and illustrating the best ways to create and sustain effective teacher and parent partnerships that will heighten the achievement of all students. Marcia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Taryn. I am so glad that you asked me to do this webinar. I'm very, very happy, and hello to everybody out there. I think of all the books that I've written, this one, Preparing Children for Success in School and in Life, is my favorite because as the mother of three children for 32 years and a wife of almost 34, I have some experience in raising children. And has it been easy? No, because it's not. In fact, in the book, I start with a one ad as for a parent. Listen to this one ad and tell me if you would apply. Must have the skills of a doctor, a lawyer, nurse, teacher, counselor, and referee must maintain a sense of humor even in the most stressful times, must be able to operate a taxi service to and from all important events, no pay, lots of overtime, in fact on call 24 hours a day, no sick days allowed, lifetime commitment. And yet I don't think anybody would apply for that, but that's what we've been asked to do as parents. I am so, so happy to invite Zach and parents from his school to join our roundtable discussion, and we will follow our agenda as outlined. The first thing we want to start with is a call to action. I want you to take a minute and just consider the statement on this slide that this generation of children may be the first in 200 years whose life expectancy will not exceed their parents. Now that is saying a lot. 
and this quote is from Dr. Don Corbett, who is a medical doctor, but he's also a best-selling author of the book Eat This and Live. I want you to take a few seconds and just let this sink in. And I have some other research to support this. The New England Journal of Medicine predicts that due to the rise in childhood obesity, the lifespan of the current generation could be reduced by as much as five years. So we're going to be talking about three reasons why, if things don't change, this generation's life expectancy may be shorter than that of their parents. As we look at preparing children for success in school and in life, we're going to look at four areas of success. I need to tell you that every time the brain learns something new, it grows a new dendrite or brain cell. Now, if you want to know what those brain cells or dendrites look like, then I want you to visualize a bunch of grapes after you have eaten all the grapes and you're left with this thick stem and then these little, these little indentations coming from the stem. Um, these, those little things from the stem are our dendrites. And every time we learn something new, we grow a new dendrite. Now, the most rapid period of growth for those dendrites is zero to four years of age, which means it would make a parent a child's first and best teacher. So if we want to raise children that are holistically healthy, then we want to do it in four areas. First, we're going to talk about how can we raise them to be academically healthy. Then we're going to look at physically healthy, spiritually healthy, and socially and emotionally healthy. Let's look at the academically healthy first. When we're talking about um, having children that are academically smart, we need to talk about the four modes of learning or the four modalities. And you need to know that people have preferences. There are some people who are very auditory learners. There are other people who are very visual. And I need to tell you that the research is showing that this generation of children may actually uh, have a preference for the visual modality because look at all the visual images that are coming into their brains via computers and video games and television. In fact, there's a study that shows that the visual cortex of the brains of today's youth may be physically thicker than it was in my brain when I was their age. So look at all the things that they're taking in visually. So that's a strong modality for many of our children. Another is kinesthetic. Many boys, particularly, are very strong in the kinesthetic modality because boy brains were meant to be active. They're the builders and the hunters and the protectors of the species, and their brain is designed for activity. And yet we take this wonderful male brain and send it to this place we call school and tell it to do what? Sit down and shut up. We need to, to get our children kinesthetically engaged as we're learning. And then the last one is tactile, and that would have to do with the hands. So people who are sculptors and people who are painters have, um, are very strong in the tactile mode of learning. We're going to talk about each of these four modes, and then I'm going to give you some tips, parents, on some things you can do at home. And teachers, I'm also going to give you tips of things you can be doing in the classroom so that you are teaching to the four modes of learning. Let's talk about auditory first. I'm going to rely on an old Chinese proverb and uh, we've heard it. It's been around for thousands of years. And the first part of it says, tell me, I forget. And that's because the auditory mode is probably the weakest mode for most people. Most of the things we tell people, they don't tend to remember. Um, probably about 18 years ago, I got very involved in the brain research. And I spent five days, as some of you may have, with Eric Jensen, who's one of the top presenters on the brain. And I learned that um, there are ways to engage the brain. And then I studied with Patricia Wolfe and David Sousa and many other people. And I took those ways and I put them all in my first book called Worksheets Don't Grow Dendrites. And I have consolidated all those ways to engage the brain into 20 strategies. So in each of the modalities, or the modes of learning, I'm going to be talking about the strategies that go along with that mode of learning. So let's talk about the strategies that help you in the auditory modality. The first one would be brainstorming and discussion. If you really want to engage your children, then you need to sit down and talk to them about what they're doing. If you have a homework assignment that you're working on, talk to them about the assignment. And remember to listen as much or more than you talk. 
I'm convinced that's why we have two ears and one mouth, because we're supposed to listen about twice as much as we talk. But just discussing ideas with them, brainstorming ideas, is a really good way to help them remember what it is that you are working on when you're doing homework. Storytelling. Anything that's told in a story, we tend not to forget. Stories. The brain remembers stories. Let me show you how effective storytelling can be. I want to tell you the story of the seven continents. When I get through with this story, especially if I tell it to you more than once, you'll be able to remember the seven continents because they are connected together. So here's my story. There once was a man named North. His last name was America. He fell in love with a beautiful woman named South. They got married, and she took his name, so she became South America. Then they had a big wedding, and they honeymooned in Europe. Now, the couple was blessed to have four daughters, and they named them all names beginning with the letter A, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, and Australia. There you have the seven continents all connected in a story. That's great. I've never heard that before. That was great. Yeah, it's actually in the book. So if parents want to use that story, if they're helping their children remember the continents, then the story is actually in the book. So see if you can make up stories that will help your children to actually remember things that you're teaching them. Um, we do a lot of making up of stories. When I, when I was raising my children, we used to make stories about everything because the brain just tends to remember stories. I can't say enough about music as a strategy. Music has three powerful effects on the brain. First of all, the first effect is that uh, it can change the state of your brain. I know you remember when you... Uh, been looking at a movie and they'll play music and you'll be in tears right in the middle of the movie or music has the ability to energize you if it's a faster tempo of music. But music also uh, helps us remember. Anything you put to music, you stand a great chance of remembering. Teachers will tell me that their children have difficulty or their students have difficulty remembering and yet those same students are walking down the hall singing the lyrics to any song, any rhyme, or any rap that comes on the radio. And what we know about the brain is that music actually helps us remember. So parents, I want to give you some websites, and teachers, I want to give you some as well, of how you can use music to actually help. If you go to Rock and Learn, let me spell that for you. That's R-O-C-K, the letter N, and then L-E-A-R-N. That's rockinlearn.com. You will find songs on that website that will help you teach the multiplication tables or reinforce the multiplication tables at home. They will help you teach addition in math, help you teach the presence of the United States in order. Whatever objective you might be helping your child with, they might have a song that can teach that objective. And then for those of you who want to produce little scientists in your children, I want you to go to W. Phillips. Dot com. That's W. Phillips with two L's, W-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S dot com. He is a science teacher and the co-author of my science book. We worked on it together, and his name is Warren Phillips, and Warren has taken science concepts and he's put them all to music. So if you'd like for your children to learn a lot of science, then they need to go and get Warren's songs and begin singing the songs, and they can learn about, um, oh, my goodness, more than 50 different science concepts. Okay. And then there is this app called Songify, which I never heard of, but a teacher told me about it. Let me spell it for you. It's S-O-N-G-I-F-Y. This is an app that you can put on your phone, or I guess on your iPad, and if you recite your lyrics into Songify, they will put it to music for you. So you don't even have to come up with a tune. Songify will do it for you. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't that nuts? I tell you, it's, it's really something. If you have teenagers, my suggestion is have them write their own songs, their own rhymes, their own raps, because when you are taking something you've learned in class and you're creating something else out of it, like a song or rhyme, you're actually using one of the highest level thinking skills. It's called synthesis and it's one of the highest thinking skills there is. And the last one is reciprocal teaching, and that is simply having your child reteach you what you want them to remember. Let's say they have to remember something for a test, then have them actually talk out loud and reteach you 
what they need to know for the test. Because if they can reteach you, they will remember it. So those are just some suggestions for helping you to help your child to improve their auditory memory. Now let's talk about visual. Let's add one more line to the old Chinese proverb. It's tell me I forget, but the next line is show me I remember, which means that the Chinese knew that providing a visual for someone is a lot stronger for remembering than just simply telling them. And if you can do both, that makes it even stronger. So I have three strategies that are on the list of 20 strategies that lend themselves very well to helping our children to become better, better visual learners. And the first one, of course, is visuals. When they say a picture is worth a thousand words, they're really not kidding. So anytime you can show your children a picture of something that you're studying, or let's say we're working on a, a particular vocabulary word and you can find a picture of that word on the Internet, then if they can see it, that memory actually sticks in their brain a lot better than you just talking about that particular vocabulary word. This also relates to something else that we talk about in the book, and that is that uh, the old adage, do as I say, not as I do, uh, doesn't work because children will believe what they see you do rather than what you say. So for instance, if you're telling your children, I don't want you to use profanity in this house, and yet they're hearing you use it, then you can't expect them to do anything else. So just actually remember that you are a visual representation of what you want your children to be. The next one is visualization, and this is used by athletes all the time. Visuals are things you can see. But visualization is seeing in your mind. It's actually seeing in your mind before the thing happens. I want you to know that all of these strategies I not only teach, I actually use them. And I visualized my books being bestsellers before I ever wrote the first book. And I want you to know that five of my books are bestsellers. That's so. right. And we're very proud <laughs> to say that. <laughs> the strategy works. And I, I picture the parent book being a bestseller as well. That's will be. Yes, indeed. And so visualization is, is really important to use, too, when you're teaching. Let me give you this example. When my oldest daughter was learning, uh, she was in high school, and she was learning words from uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet. They were studying the play, the Shakespearean play. And the word was scullery, and she could not remember the definition of scullery. Well, a scullery room is a room adjacent to a kitchen. And so... I used visualization to help her remember, remember the meaning. I told her to see in her mind, to close her eyes, and visualize that she's standing in this huge mansion. And in the middle of this kitchen, she's in the kitchen of the mansion, there is a skull, a, a, a stark white skull. They don't know where it came from. They don't know if somebody was murdered in the house, but there's a skull in the kitchen. Now, I hope you got that connection because your skull a uh, scullery room is a room off a kitchen. Well, Jen is now, let's see, she's 32 years old. And if she walked in uh, right now and you ask her what is a scullery room, she'd still be able to tell you because she still has that visualization. And they say the crazier uh, you can make the visual or the image, the more your children will remember. So you want to have them come up with or you come up with uh, visualizations of crazy things. You also need to know that there are athletes that visualize. Roger Federer visualizes himself winning every tennis match before he steps on the court. He's one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Wow. I watched Lindsey Vaughn in the Winter Olympics visualize herself skiing downhill before she took the gold medal. So people know that, that visualization actually works for the brain. Mm -hmm. And then the next one is the use of graphic organizers. And these are what we call mind maps or thinking maps or word webs or concept maps. And they actually work for both hemispheres of the brain because those children who are very strong in the left hemisphere like the words on a graphic organizer and those who are strong in the right hemisphere like the fact that it's a picture. So in the book, you will find about eight examples of, of uh, graphic organizers that you can use with your children at home. And these will help their comprehension as you're going through um, science material or social studies material or English language arts are, are really any, um, any of the content areas. So let's look at a few of the graphic organizers that are pictured here. The first one you see is called a word web. And in a word web, it's really good if you want to enlarge your children's vocabulary because in the middle box, you're going to put the keyword that you want to work on. 
and then in the other boxes you're going to put synonyms or other words that mean about the same as the keyword. So, for example, in the middle box we could put the word happy. Well, that's fine. Uh, happy is a very common word, but we want to expand our children's vocabulary. So, in the other boxes, I want to teach my children that the word exuberant, the word ecstatic, the word jubilant, joyous, exhilarated, or enthused would be uh, synonyms for the word happy. So here I'm increasing their vocabulary and I'm connecting vocabulary words together for them and really enlarging their vocabulary. And the better vocabulary you have, the better reader you, you tend to be. Let's look at the next one. In the next one, you see a story map. And in this particular story map, after you've read a story with your your children or your grandchildren. I'm a grandmom now, and there's nothing like it. And I realized that my kindergarten granddaughter was reading the other day. We were sitting reading, and I'm usually reading to her. And then she said, Mimi, that's my name. I'm not grandma, I'm Mimi. She said, Mimi, I can read this book. And sure enough, Christian began to read, and oh, my goodness, I had tears in my eyes. I was so enthusiastic. But when, when you're working with a story map, you can take a story that you're reading with your children, and then you can help them outline it by using this graphic organizer of the story map. One of my favorite stories, particularly if you if you have children that are fifth or sixth grade, is the story Hatchet. If you don't know Hatchet, you need to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, Hatchet's author is Gary Paulson, and Hatchet is about a 13-year-old young man who's plane crashes, his parents are divorced, and he's going to see his father who's working in the Canadian wilderness. And while he's in the plane, the pilot has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And and um, Brian has to land the plane, and he has to survive in the Canadian wilderness until he's rescued. So we can take Hatchet through the story map. The setting is the Canadian wilderness. The characters are 13-year-old Brian, and then his mother has a very minor part. The problem is that he must survive until he's rescued, which takes more than actually 40 days for him to be rescued. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, the events in the story would be uh, the pilot has a heart attack. Event number two would be the plane crashes, the, and he has to actually land the plane. It does crash, but he's, he's, he's not seriously injured. The event number three would be that he builds a shelter because he has to have shelter to stay alive. And then event four would be he finally is able to hunt for food. And then a fifth event would be he is rescued. The solution, of course, becomes that he's rescued after more than 40 days in the wilderness. But this just helps children comprehend stories that you might be reading. So, by the way, each one of these templates is in the book. So you have, you have a copy of these uh, contained in the book. Let's look at the next one. On the main idea and details, uh, you can take any subject that you're working on and you want to make it into a mind map. And the main idea would be in the middle. And then the circles would be actually the uh, Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, 4 in an outline, and then the ABCs would be in the little boxes. So let's take an example. Let's, let's say that in social studies we're studying the country of Brazil. So I'll put Brazil in the middle, and then in the first circle I'm going to put people, so I want to know what the people of Brazil are like. In the second one I'll put topography. I want to know what the land is like or what the you know, uh, setting is like. The next one would be food, and then the last one might be the weather or the climate. And so I can look at four different aspects of Brazil, and then what we're going to list in the smaller boxes are things that relate to each one of those categories in the circles. So it really just helps children as they go through to take large amounts of information, and as a parent or as a teacher, you can help them create these mind maps or these word pictures to show how the ideas relate to each other. The next major category is kinesthetic. In the Chinese proverb, the last line is, involve me, I understand, which means that until children actually get involved in what it is that you're doing, the light bulb actually doesn't come on for the brain. And what I'm really trying to um, tell teachers is that your classroom has got to be an active one where children are not sitting and listening to you talk but in a classroom where students are doing because it is the involvement that really helps. Two of the major strategies on the list of 20, and my favorites, I must say, are role play and movement. 
I want to tell you the power of movement for the brain. Did you know that anything you learned while you were moving is in one of the strongest memory systems in your brain, which is the reason people never forget how to drive a car? How many of you can drive a stick shift? Just think about that. If you can drive a stick, you'll never forget that. I don't care how long you drive an auto a car with an automatic transmission because you were moving your arms and feet when you learned to drive a stick shift. Riding a bicycle, that memory never goes away. Typing, playing the piano, all of those things stay with us. I had a teacher in one of my workshops not long ago who told the story of her mother having Alzheimer's, and her mother has really lost a lot of her memory, and she no longer recognizes her daughter or no longer recognizes her grandchildren, but yet her mother is a pianist. Her mother can still sit at the piano and play songs that she always played because when she was learning originally to play the piano, she was moving her fingers across the keys, and those are some of the strongest memories in our brain. And we call that memory system procedural or muscle memory. Anything you learned uh, through movement is in procedural or muscle memory. And it's the reason that the football coach in Wiley, Texas, when I, presented, when I was presenting there, stood up and said, you know, Marcia, that explains why football players um, – who teachers tell me can't retain their content, can remember every single play on the field yeah. because those plays are going into procedural or muscle memory. So here's some suggestions for getting your, your children moving. First of all, have them role play a vocabulary word. Let's say the word is um, a saunter. Well, not only talk about the definition of saunter, but get up and have them saunter across the room. <laughs> or, you know, just let them get up and role play or act out. Uh, I was teaching a lesson in um, uh, at McNeil High School in McNeil, Texas, and we had to, um, they wanted to know the four causes of World War II. Well, instead of me lecturing the four causes of World War II, I gave each group, I put the class in groups, and each group had a different cause of World War II, and they had to design a role play, and then the, at the end of class, they had to get up and demonstrate their role play for the class. So by the time I left there, every single student in there, including special ed students, knew the four causes of World War II, and uh, it was due to, to role play. Wow. And then movement is just my favorite of all the strategies. And if you've ever been in one of my workshops, teachers, you know that um, we get up and we do the number line hustle to teach us to add positive and negative numbers. Here's one that you can do at home, parents. You can do body spelling. If your children are having trouble learning to spell words, then have them stand up and do body spelling. And when you body spell, let's take the word play, P-L-A-Y. Anytime a letter in the word goes below the line, like the P, lowercase p, drops below the line, then you have them uh, re bend over and touch their toes. If they can't touch their toes, they can try and say <laughs> the letter. So you're going to bend over and say P. The L in play goes above the line, so you're going to reach for the sky, reach up with both arms and say L. The A is on the line, so you put your arms out extended beside you and say A, and then the Y goes below the line just like the P. So as children are actually spelling the word out loud, they are using the movements to go with the words. And what you find is, I promise you, on their next spelling test, they'll make 100. And we'll also improve their writing because, of course, um, our writing improves when our spelling improves. So try body spelling. It really, truly does work. And also keeps them active, I can imagine, absolutely. bending down and reaching up. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, homework becomes less boring when we get up and we're actively involved in what it is we're doing. That's right. Yep. The next one is tactile. And tactile is would also be involving me, I understand. So it's still uh, the strongest memory system in the brain. Um, and the strategies, tactiles are things, of course, we're doing with our hands. So it would be writing, drawing, and the use of manipulatives. Uh, let's talk about writing. Uh, parents, uh, have you ever written a grocery list and left the lists at home? And then when you got in the store, you remembered much of what you had on the list. And I'll tell you why you remembered a lot of what you had. It's because you wrote it down. The things we write down, we have a tendency to remember better than those things that we don't write down. So writing actually helps. I get asked this question a lot. Does writing um, penmanship and, and doing things on the computer, typing on the computer, does that have the same effect on the brain? And we're thinking 
probably not. And you can probably ask yourself, well, which one do you think would be most effective, typing on the keyboard or, or writing? And uh, I hope you said writing because the research is showing that that tends to stick more than typing on the keyboard. And I think it's probably because every letter that we're forming when we write is slightly different. And it takes a little bit more concentration than just typing it out on the keyboard. So writing tends to be more memorable than actual typing. Um, the next one is drawing. Boys particularly. Uh, many I walk in classrooms and I see young men who are excellent artists and they're sitting there and they're drawing tennis shoes and they're drawing uh, superheroes and they're drawing rock stars and they're totally off task. And I sit there and I think to myself, think of all the things that a teacher teaches or a parent teaches that children could be drawing. They could draw, oh my goodness, any number of things. And so think of things that you're working on in homework that they could draw. Because if you draw it, it will actually stick. You could draw the main idea of a story, and, and let's, let's design a book jacket for this story by drawing the main idea. You can draw a vocabulary word and its meaning. There's so many things that you, when you really think about it, that you could draw. And it's a really good strategy to use. And then the last one is manipulatives. And um, these would be things like um, counting with B. Uh, let's say we're working on counting or adding or subtracting or multiplying. Go to the kitchen cabinet and get you some, some beans, some dry beans or some uh, peas, <laughs> and actually let them move those around the kitchen table as you're learning to count. Because just having their hands on the beans or the peas helps the brain remember how to count or remember how to add or how to subtract. I'll give you a really good example. My daughter Jessica and I were working on um, um, quarts and pints and gallons, and she wasn't getting it. This was when she was in elementary school, lower grades. And so we went into the kitchen, and we actually got some containers that were cups cup sizes and pint sizes and quart sizes, and we actually poured the water from one container to the other so she could actually see how much a cup would hold versus how much a pint would hold versus how much a, you know, a, a quart would hold. And when children don't get it just by talking about it, they will get it by actually seeing it in real life. That's so anytime time you can go to the kitchen and actually show them, that makes such a difference to memory. Okay? So those are the four modalities. You want to use strategies. And in the book, I have many, many, many more activities than what I'm giving you today of how you can help your children in the modalities of the, the auditory, the visual, the kinesthetic, and the tactile. And those all relate to the academic part. But let's shift gears now because you can have children who are very academically smart, but they're just not healthy children. We want to make children that are holistically healthy, which means we've got to deal with the physical aspect, the social emotional aspect, and the spiritual aspect. There's a mind, body, spirit connection. So let's talk about the physical aspect. Two things I want to stress, and that is we need to, to encourage our children to eat healthier. And since we are models for them, if they see us eating healthy, that's a good start to them wanting to eat healthier. Um, in the book, the chart you're looking at is actually in the book, and this is a chart that uh, Karen Markowitz and Eric Jensen put together of the things that uh, we should be eating so that all of us have healthier bodies. And we already said that one of the reasons that our children's lifespans may be shorter is because of nutritional deficits. So here's a chart that you might want to refer to when you're planning uh, those dinners. And let your children help you plan dinners. Let them help you shop the groceries. Let them help you give them responsibilities for preparing the meals, setting the table. Uh, I need to tell you this, too. Uh, we're going to talk in a few minutes about how children and parents are not having the talk time that used to happen. And that talk time used to happen at the dinner table. And a lot of families are not eating dinner together anymore. And we're, we're um, I think we're, we're paying the price for that. And we'll talk more about that later. But if you can make dinner, when you can have dinner together, if you can make that a, um, a family affair, that, that's a really good thing. The second thing I wanted to talk about is exercise. And that is the fact that they say that in the olden days when people didn't eat right, they were working it off through manual labor. Now children are not eating right, and they're sitting. And this is the second reason why they're shortening their lifespans. They're sitting behind computers 
or in front of computers, sitting in front of video games, sitting in front of TV, and we're seeing type 2 diabetes earlier than we ever have before. And so this is the reason the National Football League has placed 60, gets get children up and moving 60 minutes a day because we have got to save their lives by getting them moving. And I'm happy to report I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Atlanta Falcons actually assembled the largest group of students on a football field at one time, all wow. exercising simultaneously, and now they're in the Guinness Book of World Records. Wow, that's so amazing. My, my son-in-law is a PE teacher, and he had his students on the field. And so it was really great that they set that record. Also, don't forget the importance of water, drinking water. I don't think we drink nearly enough water. And parents, they say that 75% uh, of joint, back, and neck pain uh, could be alleviated if people simply drank more water. So you want to get that water in. That is very important as well. On the next slide, you will see that I'm in good company because our First Lady, Michelle Obama, Actually, you know, her focus has been on getting our children up and getting them moving. And I want to give you just a, a second to read what our First Lady is saying. So could you take a minute and read that silently? I want you to look particularly at the last line, the physical and emotional health of an entire generation and the economic health and security of our nation is at stake. Businesses are paying out thousands and thousands of dollars for workers who are not healthy because they're not eating right, they're not exercising, they're not moving, so we've all got to join in the fight. Okay? Let's talk about spiritually what we ought to be doing for, for our children. In looking at the spiritual aspect, um, I want to talk about two things. First of all, establishing a purpose. And second of all, there's that visualizing again. We've got to help them visualize themselves being successful. Um, in the workshop that I do that goes with the book, we talk about the 40 developmental as assets of adolescents. And there are 40 things that adolescents ought to be about if they're going to be healthy. And one of those is having a purpose. And the way they define purpose is that adolescents do well when they report that their life has meaning, that their life, that they're here for a reason, it's not accidental. And they also do well when they're optimistic about their personal future. What I like to do is go in high schools and ask, um, I ask the teenagers a lot of times, where do you see yourself in five years? And I really listen to their answer because you want to see them with an optimistic future of where they see themselves in two years or three years or five years. And you want to sit with your children and you want to set some short-range goals and you want to set some long-range goals. If my long-range goal is to be a doctor, I'm not going to wake up one day and be a doctor. So you need to sit down and discuss with your child what is the path to, you know, to becoming a doctor. How many years of schooling will that take? What do you have to do after you finish college? There's an internship. There's a residency. All of those things so that, that children actually know. Will their goals change? Of course they might change. But it's important to have those short and long-range goals which give them a purpose. And don't expect all your children to have all the same goals because they're so different and so their goals are going to be different. And then we want them to visualize themselves being successful. Um, I can use myself as an example. Uh, my, my parents, our parents, I have two sisters, I'm a middle child, and they visualized us being successful and told us from day one that we were destined to go to college. It was no argument, it was, no, it was you going to college. And so we grew up knowing that we were all going to college. And my dad died more than 30 years ago. My mom is, is 87 years old now. She's still living, and I'm very thankful for that. Okay. But, um, we, I, I think they're very proud of us because my, my oldest sister is a college professor. She has an earned doctorate degree, and my youngest sister is the human resources manager for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and the High Museum of Art and the Alliance wow. Theater. So I think their expectations and helping us set a purpose early. I knew I wanted to teach at age six. So at six years of, of age, I knew I didn't want to do anything else but teach. And this is my 39th year in teaching, and I have loved every single minute of it. Wow. But we visualize that success really early. I also need to tell you before we leave this page that when adults lose this thing about purpose, is not only good for children. Everything I'm teaching you today is good for the adult brain. 
And we now know that when adults lose their life's purpose, they tend not to live very long after that. Mm -hmm. And I can give you numerous examples. Um, when Mr. Rogers' show went off the air, he, he didn't live long after his show was canceled. Charles Schultz died on the day his last Peanuts cartoon appeared in the paper. And we just had two more examples. Andy Rooney gave his last 60 Minutes expose in October, and in November he was deceased. And then, of course, uh, Joe Paterno uh, was fired by Penn State and lived only months after that. And what we know about the brain research is when people no longer have a purpose, a life purpose, they tend not to live long after That's that. That's fascinating. Okay, let's look at the last, the last uh, aspect we want to look at. And that's um, socially and emotionally. And even though this is the last one, I'm not sure if it's not the most important one because um, the brain is not nurtured unless there is a social and emotional connection. And I want to talk about two aspects. One, developing a relationship with your child. And that's actually the first chapter in the book. That's how important I think that is. That we, I've seen blended families where a step-parent or a step-mother or father comes in and doesn't bother to develop a relationship with the children. And then when the step-parent tells the teenager, I need you to be home by midnight, the teenager looks at the step-parent and says, you know, you can't tell me what time to be home. You're not my mother or you're not my father. But when that time is spent developing that relationship, it is amazing how, how, um, how much can happen, how many, many positive things can happen. Um, I do need to tell you that the research is, is kind of dismal in this area. It's showing that fathers on the whole spend about seven minutes per day in meaningful conversation with their children, and mothers spend about 11 minutes per day. Wow. And as we said before, a lot of that conversation used to go on at the dinner table, and it no longer happens there. And I'll tell you where, uh, raising my children, we did a lot of our talking was in the car. So my recommendation is when you're going to these extracurricular activities, soccer or football or ballet or whatever, turn the radio off in the car, turn the DVD player off in the car, and talk to your child. Mm -hmm. And that helps to develop a relationship. I wish I had longer to talk about the emotional bank account, but I, I must tell you about it because it actually changed our lives. The emotional bank account is a metaphor, and it comes from the seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey's work. And basically Covey says that, we make connections with people in a bank account, but it, they're not financial connections, they're emotional connections. And just like our financial bank account, if we make more deposits, those would be positive interactions with each other, then that's a, that's a deposit in the bank account and we have a strong relationship. If we make withdrawals, those are negative encounters with each other, then that's a withdrawal from our bank account and we have a weak relationship. And so what he's suggesting is that a husband and wife should for every one negative, one time that we're in an argument or disagreement or whatever, there should be at least five times when we have put some deposits in the bank accounts by telling each other how much we love each other or showing each other how much we care. And with children, I think it needs to be even more than that, maybe eight to ten deposits for every one withdrawal so that we have large um, bank accounts with people. And then the last one I want to talk about is the fact that we have got to hug and rock and love our children. Mm -hmm. We are seeing in, the, in our schools today children who are coming to school and nobody's loving them, rocking them, holding them, kissing them, and telling them they matter before they leave home in the morning. And we're seeing angry children. Um, in fact, I have a lot of research in the book to support the things that I'm teaching you. Uh, today, and one of the things we know is that when children are raised in an abusive environment, they learn that in order to get their needs met, they too need to be violent or need to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so what we need, if you don't take anything away from this webinar with this, go home and love, rock, hold, kiss your, your children and, and your grandchildren because it makes such a difference. Um, there is a chronic behavior disorder called conduct disorder that is the predecessor to psychopathic and sociopathic behavior. And it usually begins to develop before the age of eight, which is when the brain develops empathy for other people. If you've never been shown empathy, you tend not to develop empathy. Oh. And, and if you look at the life of, of your serial killers, they were usually verbally and are physically abused, and it's usually before the age of eight. So we truly, truly need to 
to show our children that they matter, and it makes such a difference to their development. So in, in closure, I just want to say in summary that we want to develop our children holistically in four different areas. Academically, we want to use the 20 strategies to help develop their four modalities, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and tactile. Physically, we want to get them moving and get them exercising and get them eating right. And spiritually, we want to help them find a purpose and be able to visualize themselves doing great things. And then emotionally, we want to be there to support them every step of the way. Thank you, Tara. That's great. That's absolutely fascinating. Thank you again for taking the time to come and present to us. I know that you're highly sought after, so we really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And now I actually want to uh, bring on Principal Zach Cazares from Lenore Kirk Elementary School. Zach, are you there? Yes, I, I am here. Perfect. Um, Zach, as I mentioned, is a principal at an elementary school, and he has along with him three of the parents from his school that are going to comment on some of the strategies that Marsha talked about and, and elaborate on some of the things that they're doing at home to kind of implement these things. So, uh, Principal Cazares, if I can have you give a brief introduction and then your parents go around and introduce themselves? Sure, perfect. Again, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Cazares, and I am uh, the principal at Lenore Kirk Hall here at the Great Dallas Independent School District. Hello, my name is Robin Barnes, and my fifth graders homeschool is LK Hall. My name is Angelina McKinnon, and I have a second and fourth grader here at Lenore Kirk. Hi, my name is Maria Fuentes, and I have a kindergarten and fifth grade. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for being able to come on and talk with us a little bit today. Um, Principal Cazares, I just wanted to start with you. Um, what of the strategies that Marcia mentioned, she uh, briefly talked about brainstorming, storytelling, uh, using visuals, role play, drawing. Are, is Lenore Kirk doing any of those things in the classroom? Yes. Um, we had the, uh, the great uh, honor and pleasure, of course, of having Dr. Marcia Tate present not only to our school, but at three other schools in our district. And uh, this was back January the 17th where she presented these, uh, these uh, strategies. And I will tell you that our teachers, the feedback was phenomenal. The enthusiasm of our staff was, uh, was outstanding. Uh, that Wednesday, literally that Wednesday, teachers began to discuss you know, what they were going to begin to implement in their classrooms. And since then, as I go around looking at the classrooms and, and, and the teachers as they were working, they have been. Um, you know, and, and again, as, as Dr. Marshall Tate, you know, some of these things we have to model ourselves. And I, I know I've uh, caught myself using humor, uh, even with the students and the staff. Um, some of them not so funny, uh, <laughs> but I think you have to sometimes laugh at yourself as well. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, also, the storytelling, and I think uh, when I have my staff development with my staff, and uh, you know that has also helped uh, with storytelling, talking to the staff, and the staff has have used a tremendous amount. I have seen again the writing has increased uh, exponentially in the classrooms. Uh, the teachers are using again storytelling, humor, movement. Uh, where I've seen uh, some of my uh, pre-K teachers where they're having the students stand up, uh, they're singing songs, they're learning rhymes with you know, some of the content that they have to learn. And a lot of the graphic organizers also, uh, that, that's something that we've been doing, but I think now it, the teachers see the meaning uh, behind it. So a lot of these, if not all, are being used at, at Lenore Kirk Hall. That's great. And, and parents, what about you, Robin, Angelina, and Maria? Are you, do you have any of your students using um, the strategies at home? Oh. Yes, mine is. I have a fourth grader, and he is using the graphing and everything when he's doing his homework and everything. And it's actually helping him a lot more now because he was struggling at first. But he's That's actually great. doing good now. That's great. And did you find uh, your children struggling with any of these strategies? And making you really need to think outside the box to get them implemented, or did the teachers do a great job of kind of just uh, teaching the students how to make them most effective at home? The teachers pretty much have done, the, done a good job at teaching them because they pretty much taught me, so they did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, so you were involved in, in the uh, process with Dr. T. Kim as well? 
Uh, no. Uh, my the, my son came home. He showed me what he had to do. So oh, got did it. a good job at showing him because he taught me. That's great. The reciprocal teaching, right? That's what we talked about. <laughs> and if he teaches it, he'll learn it. That's great. That's great. And, and Dr. Or, sorry, Principal Cazares, you actually um, I spoke to you earlier this week, and you mentioned that Lenore Kirk had implemented a breakfast program to make sure that all of the students at the school were starting off on the right foot with their intake. Yes, um, Lenore Kirk Hall started um, last year. We began a, uh, a proposal was brought to me, and the minute that I heard about it and learned, I knew that it was something that we needed to have. At the beginning, our students, we probably had about 215, if not less, students who were eating breakfast in the mornings, going to the cafeteria and eating breakfast. Uh, we have uh, just over 600 students. Well, when we began the breakfast in the classroom program, uh, that increased uh, almost to 100%. Uh, wow. So every student is offered the opportunity in the classroom setting uh, where they are also socializing and, and some of them are even beginning to do some type of, a, of a, either a, a quiz or they're having discussions about what's going on, just getting prepared for the day. So, uh, but they're eating. And so, and again, the school has won the gold uh, award from the uh, the national. Um, I'm trying. I'm getting uh, the national um, food uh, uh, society, and so it, that's been a great honor. And I think uh, again, it just goes back to as you were saying, the importance of nutrition, and so we've had the opportunity to do that, as well as. Uh, the Place 60 has also been a factor here at LK Hall, and our students are also participating in a marathon for kids, so they're going to get an opportunity to, to complete a marathon wow. at the end of the year. That's amazing. That is wonderful, and breakfast is actually the most important meal of the day, so it, it's wonderful that you've got such a large percentage of students taking part. That's great. And I, and I know um, Dr. Tate mentioned earlier in the webinar how important physical activity is to holistic development. So parents, um, how do you find um, if you're able to incorporate physical activity into your child's uh, normal daily commitment? So in between school and, and um, extracurriculars, how do they fit in their exercise? Actually, my son, Tristan, uh, Gets his exercise from walking back and forth from school because it's that's a great home. strategy. <laughs> that's great. Yes, as soon as he gets home, uh, he pretty much gets on the computer or his game. Uh, you know, so uh, he gets his little exercise in there some somewhat as far as him going back and forth to school. So that's great. That's a great way to fit it in because it's mandatory, right? He has to go to school. Oh yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, great. And what about uh, making sure that your children have balanced meals every day? Parents, do you have any creative ideas for trying to fit in vegetables and, and fruits in, in dinner or lunch? What, what I do, Miss Maria, and um, I usually my kids don't eat anything. <laughs> so I, I get the frozen vegetables. I know sometimes we cannot, you know, afford the, the uh, fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'll get them. I'll make smoothies for them, for them, and um, you know, just ask them what they what they'll like in the smoothies. So. That's great. A, a homemade Jamba Juice, huh? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, I'm glad that you mentioned frozen vegetables because that's actually a great alternative um, for providing fruits and vegetables when you can't afford the fresh section. I'm actually in that situation myself. So frozen is a great substitute and I think as long as you're making sure that they're, they're eating the right things, whether it's frozen or canned or you know, fresh is subjective. So that's great. I had a, a question. Uh, one of my parents, and, and if we can ask, um, just you know, the kids, you know, sometimes um, they um, they don't want to eat nutritious things. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so you're in the grocery store and and you're trying to get those fresh vegetables, but the kids are are not wanting uh, any of that. If you can say that, how, how what's some ideas? I guess we could go about that. I know we heard some. 
Yeah, that's a tough one because, you know, when you look at what's advertised on TV and everything, you know, I think McDonald's probably has more advertisements. One of the things that we're doing with our grandchildren is trying to, even when they go to the fast food places, is trying to see if they can order healthier things from the menu. For example, my granddaughter came over yesterday, and rather than having the french fries, she had uh, the fresh fruit along with her chicken nuggets from Chick-fil-A. So, you know, it's just trying to get in the in that fruit and then kind of seeing if you can kind of negotiate and say, you know, let's try. A lot of times they don't like it because they, they haven't even tried it. So I'll say, you know, give it a try and let's see if we can eat this. And then if, if you eat this, then you can have some of, you know, what you really like. So it's kind of bargaining with them that let's get this in and then you'll be able to eat some of the you know, the sweets or the other things that you might want. But, yeah, it's 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 much more appealing to them to eat the things that are not necessarily the best things for them. That's right. Yeah, I grew up actually in a household where I had to eat what my parents told me to eat, so I didn't really get that <laughs> bargaining power. But yeah. um, I, I watch a lot of Food Network, and I saw a book featured on there called Deceptively Delicious by Jessica Seinfeld, who is actually the, uh, show, the Seinfeld show creator's wife, and she has created a cookbook, and it's focused around ways to get things like squash and zucchini and carrots and, and all of the vegetables, broccoli and spinach, and things that um, kids typically will refuse to eat. Uh, she creates things like muffins and um, smoothies, like one of the parents mentioned, and casseroles that hide the healthy food, so you're, you're really getting the benefit of, of the vegetables and the nutrients from that, but it comes in the form of a cookie or a muffin. So, um, I, again, that's Deceptively Delicious by Jessica Seinfeld, and I think it's available at most local libraries, and they also have a website with some sample recipes, so that's something that you might want to look into as well. What is it again, Jessica? Seinfeld, uh, S-E-I-N-F-E-L-D. I think she's the wife of Jerry, isn't she? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to get that myself. Yeah. And then I just want to end, end with one more question of, with, for Principal Cazares. Uh, Dr. Tate mentioned the importance of hugging, rocking, and loving our children. And I think with all of the bullying that's going on in today's schools, that's just so important. And I wanted uh, you, Principal Cazares, to talk a little bit about some of the effects that you see at Lenore Kirk when students are coming to school without receiving adequate emotional and social support. Um, you know that um, it is a very um, a difficult um, a question, and, and I think there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, you know, we I have in the past few years that I've been here, you know, experienced some of that. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do here as a whole, not only as a district, uh, but as a campus, um, uh, the camp the district has instituted the three R's: rigor, relevance, and relationships. And and I think for us here, relationships uh, plays a very big role, and in that comes through. The, the talking uh, with staff, training of staff about the relationships that they have with students, um, the the ability to to look and uh, be able to help students who are in need, um, and it is students who uh, you know most of the students that I have dealt with are I have anger issues, um, and for whatever reason. And some of them could be because of uh, history or neglect or abuse. Um, I think that the sense of belonging and that sense of purpose plays a big role. But part of that, uh, again, is, is that relationship. The students know, the kids know, our kids, our own at home, know that we care and that we love them that that begins to build a trust and, and you are able to work with them. We also have a program here both for our females and males um, where we are working on a mentoring program. Our female teachers are mentoring some of our, uh, uh, each of our female teachers are taking on a female student who is possibly at risk uh, the same way as are the men, the men of Hall. Our teachers are also taking on male students who are at risk and doing things such as 
you know, the students are in, in Cub Scouts for the boys. And, and we're, this past Friday we had uh, a small talk session and just discussing and talking with kids on how they're doing the boys and then playing a basketball game, uh, providing hot dogs with a baked lace oh, so that not all junk. <laughs> um, so, you know, those kinds of things it, to begin to open up our arms. I know for me, at the end of the day, and the parents can tell you, uh, at the end of the day, my last thing that I say on my announcements is I tell the students, and remember, I love you. Because I don't think that's one of the things our kids may not hear uh, often enough, but they hear it from me at least once a day. May I say two things to, to piggyback on what Zach just said? I had a high school teacher who told me, now we're talking high school, not elementary, and she said that when she dismisses her class every day, she tells them, have a good evening, I love you. And she said that her high school students will stand in class if she forgets to say it and wait for her to say it. They won't go to their next period class until she says it. That's amazing. And I said, yes, you never get too old to hear it. That's right. And that may be the only time that some of them hear it all day long. That's so right. they actually stand there and wait for her to say it. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I want to say one more thing. I was presenting in Canada last week, and Harry Wong was on the program, and he said something that I thought was wonderful. Um, he said that I always greet my participants at the door, and I think teachers ought to be at the door to greet their students every day because that's mm -hmm. the beginning of your relationship. Mm -hmm. But he said to have a student, have your students take turns standing there with you. And a student for one week greets every student coming in class, and then the next week it's a different student. And he said that the schools that have implemented that have cut down on bullying tremendously. Wow. And I wow. thought, that's powerful. That's inventive, too. I hadn't even heard of that before. That's great. Yeah, it really is. Can I add something to that? It, it, you know, I'm, I myself with my, my children, I always tell them that I, uh, for parents, it's very important to tell this to their, their kids. I myself, I always tell them, I love you. I hug them every day. I had a meeting with my little one uh, the other day. She's like, Mommy, you haven't hugged me today. Oh. She oh. did. So that's, you know, that's very important that the parents, that don't do it, they should really do it. Hug their kids. Even I have an 11 year old, and he's like, you know, trying not to get get independent. But you know, it's very important that the parents do that. It is very important. It's very important, and you never outgrow your need for it. And even you know, when they get to be adolescents, if they don't want the hug, particularly in front of their friends, <laughs> there are other ways you know to show it. You know, you could do yeah. the high fives, you can do the pats on the back, you can do the handshakes, you can do. You know, I don't think you ever get too old to hug. I have a you know a 32 year old who still. I mean, we hug him all the time. So you <laughs> never you never outgrow that. That's right. I'd like to thank uh, Principal Cazares and the parents from Lenore Kirk again for joining us. I know that we are nearing the end of our uh, finished time. I actually just had a couple of questions that came through from Marsha, if that's okay. And um, I know that we said the webinar would end at 4, so if you're unable to stay for the next 10 minutes, then I understand. But we do have a special offer coming up in about 5 minutes, so if you could hang on, that would be fantastic. And um, I will just ask Marsha these questions. So, uh, Dr. Tate, the first one that we got was um, wanting to know if you can talk about some of the things that you've done uh, to make sure that your children and or grandchildren were moving and, and eating the right foods. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, let me say that I struggle along with every other parent to to do that. And I think I'm probably a lot better with my grandchildren than I was with my children when they came along. But um, in terms of moving, I don't think I realized the importance of moving when my children were little. I think instinctively I knew that they needed to be active, but it wasn't until I really got into the brain research that I realized the importance of getting them up and, and, and moving. So in the book, some of the things I'm suggesting that, that we've done is actually going outside together as a family and walking. I used to walk with my children when they were getting older, and I'd take a different one on, on my walk each time so that not only was it exercising, but it was also helping us bond, have some you know mother-son bonding time or mother-daughter bonding time, and so we would actually walk the neighborhood. And so I, I would suggest that for the movement and the exercise. Um, seeing if you could play a game of, of, of catch or baseball or something where the whole family's involved, you know, anything that gets them up and out of the house and and the body moving is going to be good for that. In terms of the eating, um, 
my su suggestion for that is, uh, and several suggestions I make in the book is, children tend to want to eat things that they help prepare. So if they're old enough, having them actually do the shopping with you at the grocery store, having them prepare the meals, talking to them about the importance of the balanced meals. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times we, we tell children what to do, but we don't give them the, the, the purpose and the reason for why we're doing it. So talking to them about uh, how much healthier they can be if we um, involve these particular foods in our you know, in our menus, helping them prepare the menus. They can help you prepare the menus, help you with the cooking, and then we all sit down and eat together. Um, so, you know, those are some suggestions. And I have some other things in the book that might help too. That's perfect. And actually, I just have one more question, and this one is for Principal Cazares. Um, Principal Cazares, uh, the participants would like to know, how did you find funding for your breakfast program? Um, I visualized it. <laughs> That's right. That's great. That's great. <laughs> I, I don't. No, no. Uh, it, it was a, a big source from um, Walmart and uh, our North Texas Food Bank. So That's it's great. through uh, Walmart has a special program where they're trying Walmart and and also Target. They're all they're trying to stomp out. Um, uh, you know, there's not enough. Uh, there's too many kids going without eating, so that they're trying to to help uh, diminish that amount uh, of students who are going without food. So uh, Walmart, Walmart and Target are, are two of their biggest uh, supporters, and who are backing this program up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. With that, I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, you'll see on the screen a couple of links. The first is for uh, Marsha Tate's consulting business. So if anyone out there is inspired by, by the presentation today, as I hope that you were, um, you can contact Dr. Tate directly at that link and perhaps have her come out to your district to host a workshop on this book or any of her other books. Um, the second link is actually um, directs you to her book. So Marsha, as she mentioned, has over a handful of bestsellers with Corwin, and at that link you'll be able to view all of them. Uh, right underneath that you will see a link to uh, Dr. Tate's Growing Dendrites online course. So Corwin, in partnership with the School Improvement Network, has developed an online course around the 20 strategies that we mentioned in this webinar. So you will be able to click there for more information. Um, lastly, this is number two in a series of webinars that we are doing with Dr. Tate. So that fourth link will take you to her previous webinar that we did last year. And you'll also be able to go there to view an archived version of this webinar in about two weeks. And lastly, we have a link to Lenore Kirk Hall Elementary School. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Cazares is the principal there, and all of our wonderful parent participants are also uh, members of that school. So if you would like to find out more about their programs and what they are doing, you'll be able to visit that link. Um, on our last slide here, I just have a special incentive for all of you that do not already own a Dr. Tate's books. Um, up until March 16th, you'll be able to visit Corwin.com and use promotional code D123A4 to receive a 20% discount. So uh, feel free to share that discount with your friends. Uh, go on and purchase any of her materials that you don't already have. And I also saw a note come through the chat that the, the deliciously deceptive book that I mentioned, um, which Corwin does not publish, but I'm happy to be able to share with you, is on sale for less than $3 on Amazon.com. Amazon so um, I thought you all might be interested in that. So I wanted to thank everyone again for joining us. Thank Dr. Tate for leading that amazing presentation, or Principal Cazares for being a part of our group, and all of the parents as well. I'd like to sh thank you. Karen, can I leave them wanting more? Absolutely. Okay. In the book, parents, I have secrets in the book of how to look five to ten years younger, how to live longer, and how to be healthier. And I've mentioned some of them tonight. One is having a purpose. When people have a purpose, they tend to live longer. Another one is exercise. Parents who exercise live longer. And another is humor. So I thought I'd end with a joke. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Zach, this is one you haven't heard. Okay. <laughs> uh, a baseball coach said to one of his young players, haven't I told you that when a strike is called, 
you do not turn around and curse out the umpire. And the young player said, oh, yes, coach, you told us that. And the coach said, haven't I told you that when you're called out at first, you don't stomp on the ground? And the coach said, and the little boy said, yes, coach, you taught us that day one. And haven't I told you that if we lose a game, you don't threaten never to play baseball anymore? Yes, coach, you told us that. Well, if I've told you that, would you please go over there and explain that to your mother? (laughs) (laughs) We are models for our children, and I think the more effective parents we can be, the more effective children we have. So it's been my pleasure to conduct this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. Everyone, you have a great evening. And again, uh, visit Corwin.com slash learning slash webinars to view an archived version of this webinar and share the link uh, with any of your colleagues within the next two weeks. Thanks again.